Hi, I'm Dennis Ward. Welcome to APTN National News. We begin in Montreal, where Assembly of First Nations National Chief Cindy Woodhouse Nipanak has set the agenda for this year's AFN AGM, calling for unity following the fallout of former National Chief Roseanne Archibald. With more from Montreal, here's Chris Sinachkete. Assembly of First Nations National Chief Cindy Woodhouse Nipanak set the agenda for this year's AGM in Montreal, calling for unity following the fallout of former National Chief Roseanne Archibald. She was met by cheers and applause for noting the theme of this year's AGM titled Strengthening Our Relations and how it's a time for all leadership to get back to the table and get back to work on what will be a very busy week of more than 75 resolutions that the Chiefs will have say on. She noted the discussions between the Feds and the AFN on the reform of Canada's child welfare and the upcoming compensation of a $43 billion settlement for the system's past harms which was announced last year. More than half of those dollars will be for compensation for about 300,000 children and their families who were harmed due to chronic underfunding of child welfare in First Nations. 20 billion will go towards reform for child welfare, which also includes proper funding. Woodhouse Nipanak was previously met with criticism from three regional chiefs saying the AFN is not including First Nation leaders in negotiations with the Feds about reform and the settlement. But Nipanak Woodhouse reassured the Chiefs this morning that all their concerns will be met when they host a special Chiefs Assembly in September in Winnipeg. She also noted Prime Minister Justin Trudeau is working on an apology to First Nations people on this file. Public Safety Minister Dominic Leblanc and Justice Minister Arif Rani also addressed the Chiefs this morning. The AFN wants to push the Feds to support First Nations policing and help increase safety measures in First Nation communities, with Woodhouse Nipanak pointing to Canada's largest mass stabbing in James Smith Cree Nation and talks of never letting an incident like that happen again. Lieutenant General Jocelyn Joe Paul from the Huron-Wendat First Nation and his wife were also recognized by the AFN with a star blanket and eagle feather. Paul is the first Indigenous officer to command the Canadian Army and hold that prestigious position. It's really build unity uh, across the country. Uh, for myself, it, it is uh, implementation of the United Nations Declaration Act. Uh, I think some of the important matters in, in terms of reconciliation is getting over the finish line with uh, uh, child and family services. It is accessing a equitable and adequate uh, resources for uh, languages, uh, First Nations, Indigenous languages across this country and uh, really getting the necessary resources for all of our affairs and uh, I think those are important matters that are going to come up over the next few days. 76 resolutions will now be discussed by the chiefs this morning and into the afternoon and for the next three days. Some of the topics include environment, treaties, First Nations housing and health. For APTN National News, I'm Chris Sinachkete in Montreal. Thanks, Creason. Well, as Creason mentioned there, AFN National Chief Cindy Woodhouse Nipanak delivered a speech this morning to open up the 45th Annual General Assembly and spoke about the 40 plus billion dollar child welfare settlement. Here's some of the National Chief's speech. While we were successful in working together and all of us coming together in this assembly to be joint on one resolution on that and negotiating the largest settlement in Canadian history, there's still so much work to do. Over the past few weeks, we have secured a commitment from the Prime Minister for a formal apology in the House of Commons, and we look to you for direction on that, to start planning that, to find out what the best way is. And we need to have those discussions across the country. They're not easy discussions, but our people and families that have been impacted by the discrimination deserve that from all of us. We've received also federal court uh, approval of a distribution protocol, which will allow for compensation to start rolling out later this year. In February, we celebrated a historic victory at the Supreme Court on the constitutionality of the act respecting First Nations children and youth. Although we never want our laws and our traditional laws, we've never given up our right to our children. We don't want them in the Supreme Court. 
sometimes things end up there. But there, it was a landmark ruling in our favour, and because of the Supreme Court has now acknowledged Canada, Canada's constitutional framework, which allows for pathways for First Nations inherent rights to be recognised, First Nations will no longer be hindered by unwilling provincial partners in the exercise of their inherent right laws and jurisdiction. So this is a huge ruling. Yesterday, yesterday it's, it's been a, a busy few weeks, and yesterday we received a draft offer from the Government of Canada on this issue. Of course, this was we have compensation. This is now on long-term reform. We have to talk about Jordan's principle down the way. But right now we're talking about um, long-term reform. We've, I'm happy for the compensation here. I think we're all um, able to discuss that and work that out. But we do have long-term reform. How do we fix these systems on our First Nations communities? How do we come together in a good way? And how do we balance all voices at the table to make sure we put that all on um, all in front of our chiefs and while this offer is under settlement privilege i can tell you today it's a very significant offer chiefs your regional chiefs will have all the details of this offer we met this morning they know the number you're able to talk about it with uh, within your caucuses privately from chief to chief i know that because of settlement privilege we're uh, not able to disclose to you that number this morning we wish we could and it'll be up to you whether that proceeds or not. That is up to you, Chiefs. It is a fair offer that will benefit the generations for our children. I, I believe it will. I think it's a fair offer. And let's never lose sight of what's, what this is all about. It's about our children, about our future. The bottom line is First Nations families are best positioned to care for our own children. And this country has to take notice of that. And we can't take anything for granted. I know that we have this offer, but there's still a minority government in Ottawa. And once they begin to sit again, every day we don't know what the future holds. Like, when a, like the elder had said before us, we don't know what tomorrow holds. That's why starting this month until mid-September, the Assembly of First Nations will host regional engagement sessions to discuss the details of, of this offer and hear your views and your recommendations. From there, we will host a special chief's assembly in Winnipeg in September to deliberate and vote on this, on this issue. And we are making sure that Canada is going to pay the bill for this meeting, including chief's travel costs. And we will have much more from the Assembly of First Nations Annual General Assembly tonight on your APTN National News at 6 p.m. Eastern Time. You can also watch live by visiting our APTN News YouTube page. Well, the Mohawk Council of Ganawage has a new Grand Chief. We get more from our colleagues at CTV. Cody Dybul was elected with 542 votes. That was the chief electoral officer announcing results early Sunday morning. Daibo defeated incumbent Grand Chief Gusanahawi Sky Deer by more than 250 votes to become the community's fifth council Grand Chief. I was initially shocked and speechless. Um, you know, I knew I had a lot of support going in. Uh, I just didn't know how much. Uh, so it was really... Uh, I was honored, you know, when he, he had read it and then immediately getting asked, you know, questions how I feel. Uh, it's not often I'm speechless, so uh, yeah, it, it was definitely a shock at the time. Daibo was formerly a council chief and before that he was a Ganawage peacekeeper. Mike DeLille Jr. was fo formerly a grand chief and before that a council chief as well. He said the jump from being at the table to the head of the table is immense like nothing you'd ever experience or nothing would ever prepare you for. Uh, I made the mistake thinking out loud that I would be able to answer every letter and any request that came across my desk that lasted all about six weeks because it's immense. Just over 1,100 community members vote in the MCK elections. The community elects one Grand Chief and 11 Council Chiefs. Sky Deer was elected Grand Chief in 2021. She was the first woman elected to the position in the community's history and the first openly gay Grand Chief. It's the first time a Grand Chief has served just one term on council in the community's history. Daibo said the main issue facing the community is land. We have land grievances, we have land that's owed to us that hasn't been respected and there's a debt and that needs to be paid back and we need to start reclaiming some of our land. 
He added that Ganawaga is not pleased with Canada's gaming laws or Quebec's French language laws. He intends to fight them. You need to stop legislating over First Nations people. Uh, you want to make your own laws for your own citizens, go right ahead, but leave Indigenous people out of it. Daibo and the 11 council chiefs took their seats at the table this morning. They now begin work and host the Assembly of First Nations, which meets in Montreal this week. Daniel J. Rowe, CTV News. A press conference is underway at this hour at RCMP Manitoba headquarters in Winnipeg. The RCMP says its Internet Child Exploitation Unit, or ICE, has arrested seven people and laid 65 charges. The ICE unit says it executed a number of warrants and laid numerous charges in an investigation into child exploitation and human trafficking. The press conference includes the mayor and investigators from the city of Portage La Prairie, a city of roughly 13,000 people, 85 kilometers west of Winnipeg. RCMP say there are two girls who were exploited, both 15 years old. According to the Mounties, on many occasions, the youth were locked in a room with adult males. We'll bring you more details from the press conference tonight on your APTN National News at 6 p.m. Eastern Time. Autumn Saganash's family is desperate for answers 13 months after the Barry woman vanished without a trace. Every day is like something happens, you know. I th we think of her every day. You know, we're not going to stop looking until we find her. The family of Autumn Shaganash is reaching out to the public again tonight in hopes people with knowledge of her whereabouts come forward to help locate the missing Barry woman. There's somebody who may have information to where she is today. She was on the phone for one hour that morning, and it's just, it's just kind of absurd to me that no one, can, no one knows who it was. Apparently, it was an app-to-app -app call, so when we pulled up phone records, it was her phone number to her phone number. Autumn Shaganash was last seen on June 9th of last year. Shaganash was captured on video surveillance, leaving a family member's home near Burton Avenue and Frank's Way. The next day, she was seen in the area of Sunnydale Park between 10 and noon at the same time an ALS walk was taking place. Earlier this year, police posted a $50,000 reward for information confirming her whereabouts. Police say their investigation has taken them to other parts of the province, including Sarnia and Toronto, as she has connections in both communities. Family members are still active in their own search. We're still hanging up posters. We're still on the streets asking anybody if they've seen her just to keep her name out there, right? Because she's still out there and you know, she still needs to be found. And there's always an answer, right? There's no way nobody knows what happened. It's hard every day, you know, I think of her every day. And someone out there knows something and is not coming forward. Now, Barry, police say their investigation into Autumn Shaganash's disappearance is still open and active. And investigators are once again asking anyone with any kind of information on her disappearance to come forward. Rob Cooper, CTV News, Barry. To the East Coast now, and fentanyl deaths are increasing in New Brunswick. The Department of Health is reporting 72 opioid deaths in 2023. The department is calling 71 deaths accidental or still under investigation, but 54% were related to fentanyl. The province says paramedics administered naloxone to 689 people. The rate of people responding to naloxone has been the highest on record. An out-of-control wildfire has one of the largest employers in the Alberta oil sands evacuating. Details on that and more after the break. Welcome back. Where sun, an out-of-control wildfire has one of the largest employers in the Alberta oil sands evacuating, Suncor Energy has evacuated non-essential workers from their fire bag oil sand site due to an out-of-control fire northeast of Fort McMurray, Alberta. The fire is about eight kilometers from the site and 50 kilometers from the Fort Mackay First Nation and Métis Nation. About 200 firefighters and support staff are on hand to help with efforts to stop the blaze, which is about 13 hectares in size. 
Temperatures into the mid 30s are expected this week with high wind gusts making the fire harder to contain. Well, much of the country is dealing with sweltering temperatures today. Heat warnings are in place in eight provinces and one territory. Some provinces have already seen records smashed, leaving people looking for the best way to keep cool. The beach is not an option, I think, for, for today's kind of situation because there are no trees, there are no shades, too hot, and kids don't like to swim in an in a ocean, so mostly water parks. In parts of BC's lower mainland, the temperature is expected to reach the mid-30s today, and up in light in British Columbia, the mercury will exceed 40 degrees Celsius. Environment Canada's David Phillips says it's been the summer of the heat dome. Well, that brings us to one of our web poll questions for this week. As much of the country is dealing with the heat wave, do you think the Canadian government is doing enough to address climate change? Yes, no, or unsure are your options there. Have your say on this and other polls poll questions this week over on our website, aptnnews.ca. Time for one last quick break, but stick around. We're off to Bannock Festival when we return. Welcome back. Here's a look at your current conditions. 18 for Fredericton and Halifax. 12 with showers in Kujuwak, cloudy, and 18 in Nain. 26 in Montreal, 23 in Val d'Or. 18 in Sault Ste. Marie, cloudy, and 21 in North Bay. 23 in Thunder Bay, 24 in Sioux Lookout. In northern Manitoba, 19 in God's Lake, 20 in Norway House. Sunny and 24 at this hour in Winnipeg, 23 under the sun in Dauphin. 22 in Regina, 23 in Saskatoon. 20 for Meadow Lake, La Ronge, and Stony Rapids. In Northern Alberta, 19 in High Level, 22 in Fort Chippewan. 19 in Edmonton, showers in 25 in Lethbridge. 21 under the sun in Vancouver, 22 in Sunny in Kamloops. 17 in Prince George, 15 in Smithers. 7 in Old Crow, cloudy and 16 in Whitehorse. Cloudy and 16 in Yellowknife, 15 in Norman Wells. Plus one in Saks Harbor, five above in Politech. 15 in Chesterfield, 16 in Arviat. Two in Resolute, nine in Joe Haven. Well, if you're around Winnipeg at all this summer, Parks Canada is putting on knowledge sharing events. They're happening every Saturday in July and August featuring Métis and First Nations speakers. Sav Jonesa has more on what to expect and where. I'm at the Forks in downtown Winnipeg, where on Saturday, folks can learn from Jamie Grasby about drumming and singing in the Anishinaabe culture. She is one of a handful of Métis and First Nations speakers featured for Parks Canada's Knowledge Sharing Series. The series will take place at either the Forks or Lower Fort Gary, 40 minutes north of the city, on Saturday afternoons in July and August. Here's a list of what you can expect. July 13th at the Forks, you will learn about drumming and singing with Jamie Grasby. On July 20th at Lower Fort Gary, you can learn about Métis beadwork with Melanie Gamache. And get your teeth ready for July 27th at the Forks. Pat Brudier will teach you about birch bark biting. Carve out time for some fun on August the 3rd and learn about soapstone carving from Frederick Spence at Lower Fort Gary. If you miss it the first time, Birch Bark Biting with Pat Brudier will take place again August 10th at the Forks. Roll on over to Lower Fort Gary on August 17th for Red River Carts with Armin and Kelly Jerome. And the last event at the Forks on August 24th will be another Métis beadwork session with Melanie Gamache. The events all take place between 12 p.m. and 3 p.m. and you might catch APTN National News at one if you're lucky. Here's to summer fun and learning about Indigenous culture. Sav Chonza, APTN National News, Winnipeg. Good stuff, thanks Sav. It's being dubbed as the biggest celebration yet for the fly-in community of St. Teresa Point, Anishinaanu Nation. 
They just spent the past week celebrating their 42nd annual Bannock Festival. T.R. Wheatley flew up to the community and joined in on the fun and shows us what exactly the Bannock Festival is and how it came to be. Pristine views from a small plane, a barge trek and a car ride. All of that before getting here to St. Teresa and Anishinaabe Nation. And just in time too, it's Wednesday and the 42nd annual Bannock Festival is in full swing. The stakes here are high, 4x4 four four trucks and land boats. Today, I came to play bingo, try my luck. Did you win? <laughs> no, I didn't even hear the numbers at the last session. <laughs> the most important part of that game. From bingo to cookouts and Ironman races to a big time stage with mainstream rockers. It's all here, deep in the woods. Nellyanne Cromarty reflects on this iconic festival in northern Manitoba. It feels good to see this many camps. I've been around since the first time. It, the real tents that they used to take around with wooden poles and everything. Raisin bannock, salt pork. Chief Raymond Monias calls this a showcase of life for St. Teresa Point. I think uh, that, that's, that speaks volumes for our nation and the, the, the character that we can exhibit to, to the rest. This festival is older than most here, including Leona Monias. She's in her 20s. Even so, most of her best memories come from this celebration. Maybe like 10 years ago, it used to be outside of our northern store, um, but they moved it here because it kept getting bigger and we needed to accommodate the people. Um, a lot of outside communities come. Balancing the old life with the new. Spectators like Roy Harper say this helps build the youth up, including helping them understand their own mental health better. There are some that need help. We need some resources here to help them all out. And with the, with the festivities going on here, a lot of young people are, are uh, volunteering. Ivan Flett has been preparing for this event since last year. He says an event of this magnitude is possible thanks to grant funding meant to combat crime and other social issues. And because we're so isolated, our youth feel like they don't matter. And they, get, they turn to drugs, they turn to all these negative things that, that mess up your mind, that mess up with your spirit. And, we, and my passion for this that drives me is we want to be able to create healthy memories, healthy lifestyles. In hopes of building a brighter future for the youth while celebrating the work the elders have already done. Pierre Wheatley, APTN National News, St. Teresa Point. Looks like a great turnout and a lot of fun. TR will have more from her trip tonight on the news. We'll also bring you the latest from the Assembly of First Nations Annual General Assembly in Montreal. All that and much more coming up tonight uh, at, on the APTN National News at 6 p.m. Eastern Time. And a reminder, you can watch the AFN AGA live by visiting our APTN News YouTube page or visiting our website, aptnnews.ca. I think they're coming back from the lunch break right now. I'm Dennis Ward, Marcy McGwitch. Thanks for being with us. I will see you back here in a couple of hours. Have a great afternoon.